Hey Slay, Hot 97, on-air personality, Shade 45, Sirius Radio, CEO of Straight Stunt Magazine, yada, yada, yada. Solitary confinement is not rehabilitating, it's destroying. Let me stick you in a box, you understand, and don't give you a contact with the world and, and feed you slop, you understand, for about a month, a week, a year. Some people go crazy in there. Some people died in the box before, you understand? That's something that I wouldn't even do to a pet dog if it got me angry. You understand what I'm saying? It's inhumane. It's unheard of. I don't know who started it. Whoever started it, they need to put their ass in there for a little while and see how they like it. Yo, it's DJ K Slay. I want everybody to come support us. You know, people always ask me, what is it like to be in a box? What is it like to be in solitary? Well, what do you do past staring at the walls? What do you do past counting the bricks in your cell? You stare so hard you can see the paint strokes in the wall. You, your mind starts to deteriorate. You drift. You live off of your memories. And when those start to fade, you forget what your kid face looks like. You can't remember the last time you've seen another person or touched another person. These type of things lead you into delirium, into hallucinating. And you end up talking to yourself. You end up having the comfort of your own mind. But without anyone else there to validate, what you're doing is correct. How do you know you're not going crazy? How do you know talking to yourself is not problematic? Uh, we don't. So we're social creatures, right? We are connected to each other in a way that social activity de de determines how we make decisions, right? Those type of extreme differences causes permanent damage to the human being. I'm Deepak Chopra, you're watching One World with Deepak Chopra, brought to you today from NASDAQ Omex market site in New York City. And my very special guest today is Erica Ford, and we'll learn everything about her in the next few <laughs> minutes, hopefully. So Erica, we met a while ago now. How many years ago is that? Not that long ago. It was um, September... 2011, because it was the, uh, the anniversary yeah. of September 11th. That's right. It was the 10th year anniversary. Yeah. It was and love in uh, we had a Love in Action program at uh, Deepak yes. Home Base. Yes. Uh, Russell Simmons was yes. there. Yes. And I learned a lot about you and the work you've been doing here in New York City. Tell me how you got started. Let's go back to the beginning. I got started um, growing up in South Jamaica. Uh, in the 80s, it was a crack epidemic that impacted the community very heavily, and a lot of people were affected by either being killed or taken off to jail. And looking at my peers and seeing that a lot of their children were left behind with no father, and you know the, the mother very upset and angry at the fact that now her partner and her provider was gone, um, was stuck. And I wanted to try to give something different to young people coming up under me. And, and I attended a rally. And just like sitting, people who sit and listen to you speak, something happens inside of those uh, events that we realize there's something greater than ourselves. And we realize what that... What year was this? That was December 12, 1987. That was December 12, and What did that lead to? Where was that with this rally? Um, it was upstate New York. It was upstate New York, and it led to me being a, an activist, an advocate, um, a voice for the voiceless. And I organized the community around all kind of issues. And, and in doing that, I met a lot of young people who needed a lot of help. And 
And also in doing that, I would go around the world and around to different places. And when I come back to my community, they're like, okay, what about us? What are you going to do for us? How are you going to help us? So I started an organization in my community called Life Camp um, a number of years later. And in starting that, we started in high school and we wanted to give young people a second chance because a lot of young people either get suspended or kicked out of school and they feel like they're a failure. They feel like they can't come home from prison and start life over or reform themselves from the act that they committed in one part of time in their life. And, and if any of us were known for the worst thing that we did in the world, we wouldn't be accepted in society. So we all at some point in time get a second chance and these young people I was able to give a second chance and and started to do the work and one of the young people that we started and particularly for was two young men it was um, Jashawn and Jaquil and and their father was killed he was a, a big-time drug dealer in, in Jamaica Queens and he was killed helping a friend out and and I saw Jashawn the oldest son stopped living after that literally he stopped going to school he stopped participating and stuff, he stopped living. And Jaquil, who was the younger brother, who we all know now is our urban yogi, he was following in his brother's footsteps. You know, he was just looking at his brother like for the guidance and, and leadership. And we, 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 we grabbed them into the organization or, or brought them into the organization and always made them come to participate. And from that, um, and I'm speeding to, to where we are now, I, they live in a, in a housing development, and a lot of times in a housing development, the only thing you get spo exposed to is negative environments. It's drinking on a corner or smoking on a corner. And I thought that bringing Jaquil to something new, yoga, would begin to have him take care of his mind, body, and soul. For years, the oversight body overseeing the city's Department of Correction has had real-time access to hundreds of security cameras on Rikers Island, allowing staff there to review events at the troubled jail complex whenever they wanted. Last week, that changed. In a statement on Wednesday, members of the Board of Corrections said, the Department of Correction recently revoked the board staff's access to independently review Genetech, its security footage system, the body-worn camera system, and handheld video at any time and forbade the recording and use of such video in our work. The revocation of access to video at any time stands at odds with the New York City Charter. The board is demanding the decision be reversed. Officials at the board say it has used its unfettered access to do its job of oversight of the city's jails, whether that's monitoring violence or overcrowding. For example, um, when there was a severe overcrowding in EMTC uh, a while ago, um, we, the video was able to show us uh, whether it was getting resolved or not. And uh, we cannot rely on the Department of Correction uh, to tell us uh, exactly what's happening in, uh, in those kind of situations. Under the new protocol, the board no longer has access to this video in its office and must request access to it at the Department of Correction headquarters. Spokesperson for the Department of Correction, Cindy York, won this statement in response. We are an agency deeply committed to transparency. A change in protocol was made concerning how, not if, the Board of Correction can access all real-time DOC camera footage. BOC members are able to view footage at a designated location, which does not impede their ability to perform oversight of our jails and aligns with the city charter. The department should have began. We are engaged in a systematic approach to limit the oversight of the Board of Correction instead of what it said. This change comes days after New York One received body-worn camera footage from the Board of Correction as part of an investigation into mental health care on Rikers Island. Stop resisting or chemical agents are going to be utilized. You're going to spray me, I'm not even going to throw it. Stop. Yeah, you are being, you're, 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 because I don't want to go. The footage shows one detainee, Eric Tavira, who died last year, being transferred and sprayed with a chemical agent. Violence. Stop resisting. Stop resisting. New York One received the footage through a Freedom of Information law request with the Board of Correction. It's unclear if the department's move to curtail the board's access to this kind of video was in response to the board's public disclosure. Courtney Gross, New York One. Officers have now been indicted, accused of covering up the assault of a Rikers Island inmate 
by one of their own. Prosecutors say 31-year-old Carl Williams, 58-year-old Roy DeWar, and 64-year-old Jatan Das were charged with official misconduct and multiple counts of falsifying business records. Prosecutors say Williams hit an inmate in the face in 2021 inside Otis Bantam Correctional Center. DeWar and Das watched the attack on surveillance video but submitted a fake report saying the inmate was being aggressive. Time is 4 30. The broken system that is Arizona prisons. Ryan Thornell is the new Department of Corrections director. APC 15 has exposed a number of recent problems, including broken cell doors, violence, and chaos. Uh, Thornell will be the department's third new director in just the last four years alone, and not everyone is thrilled with that selection. Here's ABC 15's Mark Phillips. In May, the inmates are referred to as residents. Solitary confinement replaced by restrictive housing. It allows inmates to leave their cells four to seven hours a day. They exercise, have access to a computer tablet, phone, and television. It's part of the state of Maine's reimagining of incarceration. And Arizona's new director of corrections, Dr. Ryan Thornell, helped oversee and develop it. It's comparing day to night. This guy is walking in, and I hope they gave him a heads up to say you are walking into post-World War II Berlin, okay? Carlos Garcia spent 20 years inside Arizona's prisons as a corrections officer. Now he leads the 1,400-member Arizona Corrections Peace Officer Association. Garcia knows better than anyone the enormous challenges Dr. Thornell inherits, from infrastructure and security failures like broken locks on jail cell doors, first reported by ABC 15 investigator Dave Biscavine, to a recent federal court decision finding Arizona's prison health care system and conditions for confinement unconstitutional. We are talking about Arizona. We have over 30,000 inmates. We have over, we have like nine security threat groups, gang members, violence. They don't have those problems over there. Garcia fears someone from outside of Arizona just isn't suited for the job. But in announcing Dr. Thornell, Governor Hobbs said his work re-envisions traditional policies and approaches to incarceration, challenging the status quo. Mark Phillips, ABC 15, Arizona. Morning. There was supposed to be a city council hearing about the NYPD's SRG. Uh, some city council members wanted to grill the police department about that controversial unit. Uh, but once again, that hearing is not happening. I'm joined by several advocates uh, to talk about this situation. Uh, Donna Lieberman from the NYCLU. Thank you for joining us. And Micah Phillips, uh, she alleges that uh, the NYPD's SRG abused her during some of the riots a few years ago. Donna, let's start right here. You've been here before talking about SRG. Why is this council hearing not happening? Well, the simple reason is that apparently the NYPD has just refused to show up. Um, we think the hearing should happen anyway. Uh, it's important for New Yorkers, um, uh, over a hundred of whom have um, lined up to testify tomorrow, gotten ready to testify about their experiences and the harm that the SRG has caused. Um, but the council isn't doing it. The NYPD is not doing it. And so much for oversight and transparency. And, you know, we're looking at some video there. This was in the Union Square area a few years ago where a lot of people said they were roughed up by SRG. Uh, this is the bike unit that's a part of SRG. Uh, Micah, what was your situation? What happened with you? Um, I, I, I could name several as, as the SRG is, has now taken a, a tactic of, of uh, just totally locking out protesting across struggles. So the most, um, I think, notable one that probably New Yorkers have heard of before is from Mott Haven in the Bronx, which the Human Rights Watch group called um, a humanitarian issue, um, where they kettled us. Uh, it was just two months, but maybe two weeks after the George Floyd movement uh, had started. Uh, we were marching in Bronx and were within a block or two, immediately kettled on one side. Uh, it, it's caused immediate panic, which caused us to move forward. And we were immediately surrounded by uh, bicycle SRG people and these, this, 
extra militarized uh, riot gear uh, where they um, uh, proceeded one by one to take us down um, after cuddling us until curfew was over to take us down and abuse us. I myself was slammed on the ground so hard and so often that another police officer had to step in and, and, and tell him to, to walk away. Um, I've been marched down a bridge and watched a friend stripped completely naked by SRG um, and paraded around the bridge for half an hour. I, you know, I, I did reach out to the NYPD. The NYPD told me to reach out to the city's law department, Corporation Council for the city. Uh, they basically said they're not commenting about why, uh, you know, the hearing is not happening tomorrow. Why continue to push this issue, Donna? You've been doing this. I mean, this started really uh, back in... Uh, I guess to 2020 when we, we got the video, we saw a confrontation, but obviously the union was started under the de Blasio and Bill Bratton era. Yeah, you know, the SRG is a classic case of a government bait and switch. You know, they, they, they pitched the SRG to New Yorkers as an anti-terrorism unit, unit, and it has never done anti-terrorism work, and it has only had as, it, as its unique portfolio protest. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they show up at protests and turn them into police riots. You know, they turn, and, they, and they- We're looking at, so folks know, some training when they were initially uh, announced, they are part of the counterterrorism division or affiliated with them. So they have some of the long guns, some of the similar training. Well, they've got, they've got military we grade weapons. They go in camouflage. They have bicycles that they've turned into weapons. Um, and, and, uh, but they are, and they're known as the escalators in chief. Uh, they're also known as the NYPD goon squad because literally they show up at peaceful demonstrations, not riots, Dean, peaceful demonstrations, and they turn them violent. And the violence comes from them, not the protesters. The NYPD has said over the years, they, they need this unit. They're well-trained, they're organized. They use, when they use the bikes, it's to get to protest or emergencies yeah, you know, swiftly. Right, we think about training as a good thing. Actually, they're mis- trained. You know, they turn training into its opposite because they're trained to see um, uh, protesters who are protesting for civil rights, protesting for equality, protesting police abuse as bad and potential violence. But, but for, for, for right-wingers, for the Proud Boys when they show up, well, it's all, how can we help you, sir? And it's, it's remarkable, you know, the, the bias built in, but also the, the, the predilection to violence, to creating violence and to treating protest instead of as like as American as apple pie, which it is, it's at the core of our democracy, they treat it as, as riot. And they come in, you know, not quite guns blazing, and they have hurt so many people. Very quickly, tomorrow, at City Hall, you're having a protest. Because when you appeared here last time in the fall, that's when you ended up getting a city council hearing, but it's been canceled. This is the second time, am I that's correct? That's right, so that's right. Tomorrow, and then I want to give Micah the last word. We have about a minute left, people but are, tomorrow. There'll be hundreds of people there tomorrow who were supposed to be testifying at the hearing. Steps of City Hall, I think 9.30, 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. And Micah, what do you think, final word, should happen to the SRG? I just, if anybody's watching this, um, the videos that you see, it, it's, uh, it's easy to imagine that the SRG are only gonna be doing this type of, of, of behavior for these protests, but, but they do it for reproductive rights protests, for clinic defenses, they do it for simple uh, drag story hour defenses, they will do it to anybody. Now they're being deployed to, I know I'm, time is running out, they're being deployed to precincts in high crime areas, but when you look at the 50-a.org of these officers, there's a high rate of false arrests, of false pullover, uh, and these are just the CCRB complaint allegations, and now they're deploying the SRG to these precincts under the guise of high crime to terrorize black and brown um, people and breakup families. And, and I just, and if anybody could hear that and know that it, SRG is not just going to be against me, it's going to be against all of us. And, and, and I'm quite sure at some point they will release a statement, the NYPD, but I do want to point out once again that I, I did reach out to the NYPD and the city's law department about, you know, why is this hearing not 
happening and they basically said no comment and i know donna you will continue to push the issue absolutely isn't this so transparent isn't that what the mayor ran on transparency Ooh. all right donna micah thanks a lot thank for joining you so us. much thank you as prisoners are nearing two weeks of a hunger strike against conditions they call inhumane at least two dozen prisoners have abstained from food for 13 days now in protest of solitary confinement policies in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. KXN's Ryan Chandler reports on the changes they're demanding. They get lucky to get out of their cell for three hours a week. Texas prisoners starving in solidarity against solitary. Some refusing food for almost two weeks now, protesting for the more than 3,000 people kept in isolation. Strike organizer Brittany Robertson shares their personal accounts. One inmate sent her this calendar, showing just seven days of recreation allowed in a month of solitary confinement. You don't allow them outside. You don't allow them to feel a hug. And then you let them out. What Texans need to know is that the lack of rehabilitation directly contributes to your crime rate. The Texas Department of Criminal Justice says solitary is used judiciously for only the most dangerous prisoners. They report they've lowered the isolated population to less than half of what it was a decade ago, telling us they are committed to continuing reducing that number by providing effective programs that offer pathways for inmates to leave segregation. But some lawmakers are pushing to restrict the practice this session. Irving Democrat Terry Meza filed a series of bills to limit prisoners' time in isolation to a maximum of 10 days, calling on the state to study its mental health impact. They're not asking for freedom or, you know, to be released. They're not even pleading innocence. What they're saying is, I'm in here for 20 years. I'd really like to have programming and to come out a better person. Ryan Chandler, KXAN News. And previous efforts by prisoners have led to change. In 2013, nearly 30,000 prisoners in California joined a hunger strike to protest solitary confinement conditions. It brought attention to a federal class action lawsuit claiming prolonged solitary confinement violates the constitutional ban on cruel and unusual punishment. Now, after the large hunger strikes, California negotiated a settlement agreeing to end the practice. and police officers rushing to the area of the campus magnet high school in Queens yesterday afternoon as two students were left bleeding with bullet wounds at the bus stop. The double shooting unfolding near the intersection of Linden and Springfield Boulevards just before five. A 16-year-old girl was wounded in her ankle and a 14-year-old boy hit in the leg, according to police. They say a big fight led to the shots being fired, though it's unclear who the targets were. Cops chasing a 13-year-old boy who tossed the gun, arresting him on scene. Earlier this week in the Bronx, a 16-year-old was charged with shooting a police officer, prompting the mayor's continued call to disarm teens who are helping fuel the city's gun violence. Too many young people have too many guns in their hands. And our job is to create a pathway to stop that and to ensure that we remove these guns off our streets. According to the NYPD, shootings involving teenagers surged at the end of last year, about 30% in the number of suspects and victims, respectively. The 13-year-old in this case has not been identified because of his age. Police sources tell us this is his first brush with the law, and he's going to be in family court later on today, accused of a slew of criminal weapons. <laughs>